thank you all for joining. Um, we are a small group today, but I guess that'll be a better debate. Um, welcome to Cata Lunch and Learn. We are interior branding experts, and we would like to share our research ideas and insights with you. Thank you for joining us for a 30 minute lunch debate. Just a little housekeeping, we're all gonna be muted to avoid background noise. And I would encourage all of you to put your questions into the chat and we'll run through them later. We have two speakers today, as you can see, Dan and Sarah. And today we're gonna to talk about digital native brands and how they have disrupted the bricks and mortar retail space. I'm gonna kick off by asking the first question. So can you define a digital native and are all digital natives direct to consumer? Thanks Meha for introducing us and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I think the most obvious example to start with of a brand that is a digital native, um, but doesn't fit the bill of the brands we want to talk about today is probably Amazon. Um, because yes, it's digital native, but it's not vertically integrated. It's online, um, it started to, it's, made, it's born online, um, it's only very recently started to go into physical, but it's a marketplace. Um, whereas a digital native vertical brand is one that was born online, that sells directly to its consumers, um, to its customers via its own proprietary website. The brand name is usually the same for the product as it is for the company, as it is for the website, um, and it sells its own goods um, rather than an assortment of third parties. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think you know obviously Amazon has dominated um, global retail for the best part of two decades now, and is experimenting with mixed success with own brand products in various areas. But what we're what we're more interested in today are brands like, uh, for example, Glossier and Gymshark, who have launched with the sole intention of creating a brand that connects directly to their consumers and purchasers and that understands those purchases very well. And therefore, um, from, a, from a retailing point of view, from a legacy retail point of view, the advantage that those brands have is that they have a huge amount of data that they've gathered about who purchases from them, how frequently they purchase, where, when and why those purchases occur, and also, you know, how, how, those, how those customers interact with the website, where the purchases go wrong, where products are in a basket and they get left. Yeah. You know, so they, they are, they've built from the very beginning a deep understanding through data of how mm -hmm. their customers interact. And it's how that understanding may be brought when they move into, um, into physical spaces, yeah. when those brands that have started off as digital brands are then now looking at, well, what would we do with physical? Yeah. How does that thinking potentially um, an understanding of their customer shape what they do? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, Dan. Um, it may surprise people to hear that Netflix um, is opening a Tokyo flagship this year in, in 2022. And the idea is to bring the brand closer to what they call their every fan. So they're going to be selling exclusive merchandise from certain shows. They're going to have recreated sets, a bit like Harry Potter World, um, where you can wander around. Um, from their Netflix original shows. And there's gonna be an installation which explains how their famous um, 2000 taste group um, algorithm works. So they're really creating this sort of destination brand experience um, from all these elements. Um, you mentioned Glossier, so it's worth touching on beauty, I think. Um, Korean brand called Maria, which is a beauty brand, um, which has opened up an experiential flagship in Seoul in South Korea um, called Villa de Maria. And it's community driven, it's aimed at social media savvy millennials and probably more Gen Z actually. Um, it's got a multi round shop, it's got a cafe, it's got a makeup salon, it's got production studios where they're creating social media content. So there's a really nice sort of circularity there as to what the purpose of the store is, feeding right back into their online and into their brand. Um, another interesting sector as far as this goes is fitness. I think we've seen for quite a long time, um, brands like Lululemon are hosting fitness um, classes in their stores, making different use of their space rather than giving it all over to merchandising. Um, On Running is a Swiss brand, which has taken it one step further. Um, they've got a flagship in New York, which reimagines performance analysis. Um, so it's got a, they've got a 62 foot screen, which occupies an entire wall and there are ceiling sensors that monitor movement patterns. So when a visitor runs the length of the store, they then receive this very personal analysis 
of their running style and of how that plays into the um, type of shoe that's going to suit them and the type of shoe that's going to that's going to work for them. So yeah, some interesting examples there, I think. But I think I think you know putting the putting the data to one side for a minute. One thing that that is interesting that that all three of those those brands are doing are beginning to, um, in some way, kind of demystify their production process. I mean, Netflix is 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 not a retailer and is not especially, I don't think, going to be setting up a retail experience when it opens that flagship in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. What it's probably more interested in is how it connects with consumers. And how the consumers interact with it as a parent brand yeah. and with their with their entertainment brands as well. But you, you know, you were talking about the fact that they are looking at um, you know almost explaining the algorithms, explaining mm -hmm. how they prepare content, how they then pre present the content yeah. to their the users. Work. Yeah, showing yeah. the workings, which is yeah. something we've you know we've been talking to retailers of, of, of various types mm -hmm. about for for a few years now. Is that actually you know, whereas if we think, you know, back to um, high-end restaurants 20 years ago, the kitchen was hidden away because yeah. the kitchen was the dirty place yeah. that you didn't want to know what was going on or you weren't supposed to know what was going on. It yeah. was the, where the magic happened, yeah. but this this stuff then beautifully yeah. arrived yeah. without that backstory. And, and now, you know, most restaurants, I would say, mm -hmm. that have opened in the last decade are opening with some form of open kitchen or show kitchen, yeah. which is about recognizing that, that, that it's interesting seeing people work. Yeah. It's interesting seeing the care with which certain processes yeah. happen. Of course, you have to control that. There are some processes that are boring or not particularly aesthetically yeah. pleasing, but Netflix is trying to talk about how its cleverness built into its system helps yeah. people. Yeah. Maria, um, the, the Korean beauty brand mm -hmm. you touched on, mm -hmm. is making some of its products yeah. in-house, yeah. in the store. The flagship is about a place to meet, a place to spend time and a place to engage with the brand and purchase, but also to see how things yeah. are made. Um, and, and I guess on running is the most traditional retail mm. of those three examples mm. in the sense that it is definitely about selling product yeah. and they're about selling you the right product yeah. as a customer as a user as a runner yeah. what of your what, what are their shoes what are their ride range mm -hmm. is absolutely mm. right for you and how are we as a brand going to help yeah. you make that correct selection that's not necessarily particularly innovative of itself because a lot of specialist running yeah. stores as we know have been doing that with treadmills yes. and with yeah gate analysis exactly. um, over yeah. the last you know number of years but what they're doing is bringing that technology bringing that understanding and also bringing a proprietary product yeah. their own shoes their own sportswear into what's an incredibly competitive market yeah. um you know nike and adidas have dominated this market for years but as you, as you pointed out with lululemon um we've already touched on gymshark there are brands that have recognized that there's space for other operators to come in and within 10 years have a, a fairly reasonable slice of that action um, without needing to compete absolutely mm -hmm. on the on the on those huge brands terms yeah. they're not trying to compete everywhere they're recognizing gymshark recognize we can do this with gym clothing lululemon the similar thing with fitness of a different yeah. angle on running being very serious about running and not trying to service other sports or service yeah. leisure wear particularly yeah. i mean of course there are adjuncts there but that i so i suppose we're looking at brands that really understand their niche mm -hmm. even if their niche like netflix is yeah. enormous maybe it's 500 million people yeah. i don't know yeah. but but are really focused on it and that a lot of that is is about how they from from what we said at the beginning is about how they've used data how they've used data from the very beginning yeah. of their lives as brands to guide their decisions and to and to do things and to course correct where needed. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if any or all of those three store experiences, if they are stores rather than yeah. just spaces to spaces to, yeah. to connect with the brand, will 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 evolve over time because they'll see that some things work and some things don't. And there's no shame in iterat being iterative. Exactly. That's if you're if you're a digital yeah. if you're a digital brand, yeah. it's always been about getting to market and then. And then testing, gathering data, yeah. and course correcting or, or recalibrating where needed. Yeah, and I was thinking the data gives them the confidence to make the right investment decisions. So you know the sixty-two foot screen and giving over a huge swathe of prime real estate in New York for On Running's flagship over to not merchandising. 
Mm -hmm. That might feel very, very risky to a traditional retailer because you see the missed opportunities of the per square foot that isn't covered with trying yeah. to sell things. But actually on running knows that in order to sell more of its trainers and to retain its um, retain its, its premium positioning within the trainer market, which is very competitive, it needs to offer something that goes beyond ordinary merchandising, a reason to visit the store. You can't try this technology anywhere else at this moment in time. You can't install the ceiling sensors in your own home. You no. can't achieve that level no, that's of knowledge true. and understanding. And I guess, I guess you know, so, so you, you talk about, you know, that... that one of the things that we recognise very strongly is that you know retailers, online retailers, uh, you know digital digital brands moving into the physical space have it easier today mm -hmm. than legacy retailers who have a, an estate of an estate of physical spaces that they still have to make work, that still have to contribute money, still have to contribute turnover sure. and profit. Now, if you're coming in, if you're Gymshark, we know that Gymshark, as an example, are opening a flagship store mm -hmm. this summer in Regent, Regent Street. Street in London. That it won't matter. They they've gone from in eight years. They've gone from nothing to turning over seven hundred pounds a year, yeah. seven hundred million pounds a year. Sorry, selling direct to yeah. consumers. It, you know they don't need to sell a single thing if they don't want to out of that out of that flagship yeah. store. It could be purely based on brand connection, brand engagement, and learning more yeah. about their customers in yeah. a physical space and finding a new place for those customers to interact. Yeah. But equally, the other side of that coin is that successful legacy retailers have now been retailing for 10 or 20 years online as well and are a lot a lot of those retailers are now moving up to 50 percent or going past 50 percent of their turnover coming from digital sales and that brings them the same amount of data as those natives have yeah. from the beginning so there is there's a there's a kind of a sense of catch up and transition yeah. within within the sector at the moment and those brands have more long-term problems with, in terms of how to recalibrate their physical estate, which is not as easy as recalibrating a website or a digital product offer, but they've got that data now. They're learning more about customers too. Um, what, um, what do we think, you know, are there any good examples mm. of, of, of um, you know, legacy, legacy or her yeah. heritage brands, yeah. I suppose, yeah, are that are doing, really are doing something with that? Yeah, there are some really interesting ones. So if we look at Walmart, which is, you know, obviously an absolutely huge grocery operator in the US um, with, you know, a lot of heritage um, behind it, they have a new store concept that works hand in glove with their app. So they're encouraging customers to shop the physical store as they would Amazon's to help direct them to the right aisle because the stores are so big um, and to help them navigate it. So, and of course the increased app usage will then yield the customer data. So they're gathering customers data in different ways um, mm -hmm. it's things like it's, it's all very cleverly tied together so that exterior and interior typefaces all the signage is the same on the app as it is in the store so there's that nice um, omni-channel experience from a customer's point of view or as a customer would see it there's more flexibility within the service proposition so using the app helps you around the store more easily you can also use it to click and collect other ways to access the product so that felt like quite a clever example perhaps from you know a slightly less than expected quarter um, a big, you know, operationally driven um, grocery retailer. At the other end of the spectrum, Burberry, um, obviously heritage British fashion brand. They have a physical store in Shenzhen in China, which is like the, um, the Silicon Valley of, of China. It's where all the latest, newest innovations are coming out. Um, so the store is one run by WeChat, which is owned by Chinese tech giant Tencent. And we might think of WeChat as a sort of, you know, messaging app, a bit like um, WhatsApp, mm -hmm. but it's actually much more than that. It's used for payment, it's used for communications. It's sort of completely integrated into an urban Chinese consumer's life to the point where it's quite difficult to operate without it. If you don't have WeChat, you're going to struggle. Um, mm -hmm. So the Shenzhen flagship was launched in 2020 with Tencent. Um, and they've made the store into a really good example of, you know, what we're calling a Fiji social space. So you get an avatar when you join and you can use the Burberry WeChat app to the, the mini program rather like a digital concierge. So you can use it to um, book a table at the cafe. You can use it to order clothes to um, your changing room you can um, change the fitting room you can change the lighting and the music in the fitting room you can really personalize that experience um, and you can have a, an in-store stylist appointment so it's not just about selling product it's about engagement with Burberry at completely on completely different levels that are completely new and are therefore allowing them to go after new consumers who perhaps you know wouldn't be in the market for a trench coat um, but they've created such an interesting store environment here that it is compelling enough to encourage visitors um 
Another example is Showfields, which is gets called a department store, but it's not really what we would think of as a department store. Um, opened in 2018 in Soho in New York, and it calls itself the most interesting store in the world. So it wants to bring the most exciting, interesting example of anything there is, whether that's, you know, a pen or a glass or whatever it might be. Um, and when they started, they were a showroom, so they had very little inventory. They wanted to give the space over to showrooming, so to showing off the different examples of um, that each brand had to offer and um, giving them the space to shine. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that customers would would pay for their order and, and have it shipped and it would be there within two days. But it turns out that instant gratification is still a thing. Customers want to be able to walk out with their most interesting bars or their most interesting pen. If it's portable, they want to take it with them. So Showfields has changed the way it operates in response to that. So they've introduced near field communication tags. So you can walk around with your phone, you can scan the product that you want. You can still carry on shopping the store without having to carry the product. But then when you leave, you use the um, NFC tags to pay for, your, um, pay for your product and you take it away with you there and then. So yeah, three quite different examples, but where you're seeing brands who are definitely started off as bricks and mortar um, and are integrating interesting learnings, I think, into what they're doing. Yeah, and I think, I think if we were to find a thread across all of those, it's about, it's about each of those brands understanding their specific customer journey or customer journeys that they want to service in those environments and looking at how technology can really enhance that or be fundamentally part of that yeah. rather than an add-on, rather than being a layer. It's really, it's, it's yeah. part of the same thing. I think, you know, Walmart are the one, in, in some ways, Walmart impresses me. Well, in fact, they all impress me. Walmart yeah. impresses me most because as was prior to Amazon, the largest retailer in the world, mm -hmm. you expect it to move slowly, yeah. to be heavy and to be clumsy in some ways. But in fact, what it's doing with its new store concept, with its new stores and with this, digital integration is really thinking about how to bring the customer journey to life through digital, recognizing that people spend more and more times interacting through their devices, through their phones, yeah. and that with a, with a really well-designed customer journey that the phone supports, yeah. they can also be, they can be helping the customer, yeah. but they're also beginning to gather that level of data, as you were saying, that you would, you would traditionally have got through a digital exactly. only journey. Yeah. So that's really interesting. Um, Burberry, I think, have been really brave. Um, they've read, well, they've also understood China properly. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, have, a lot of Western retailers have made a lot of mistakes yeah. over the last 20 years with China. But I think that what Burberry have done, which is, which is very good, is actually bringing, um, bringing, partnering with Tencent, partnering yeah. with Expert, understand, who knows the market, who knows the customer very well. And also that store is a lot younger than you would expect it to look. I know this is not the point that we're trying to make, but they've recognized that yeah. going into China, going into Shenzhen in that particular environment and the type of product mix that they'll sell and what people want to buy from them is not that wholly yeah, heritage driven the experience, experience. that people want to have with them as well as it, it does feel like you're a visitor to that store rather than a shop. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, it's that's experiences the, at the forefront, exactly. isn't it? Yeah. But not in a gimmicky way, in no. a way that's actually useful. No. And I think, and Showfields, just to kind of wrap up, is 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 interesting because they started off by being a, an aggregator, yeah. if you like. They're not selling their own branded yeah. product particularly. Yeah. They're focusing on interesting sourcing, on yeah. curation, and, and a pre presenting that. And, you know, when the world was talking about showrooming mm -hmm. three to five years ago, that was absolutely what they did. But What's really interesting for me is that, as you've, you've said, Sarah, is that they found that although that's a great principle, people still want to take something away. They still want that physical yeah, reaction. Yeah. I've bought this thing. Yeah. I want to take it home with me. I don't want to wait a day or two days yeah. for it to arrive yeah. because it's easily portable. Please let yeah. me take it. And yeah. so they, they've pivoted to bring inventory in so that, that they can they can hit that endorphin yeah, rush exactly. that people are looking yeah. for and, and, and tweak, their, tweak their journey and recognizing that that's, you know, and in some ways I think that constant experimentation and evolution is a really important part mm. of the, the next decade of retail. Yeah. None of us are going to be standing still. Mm. Things are going to have to be trialed and, yeah. and if they don't work, it doesn't mean you failed. It means yeah. you've learned something. Exactly. How can you take that learning and bring it yeah. into what you're going to do next yeah. or listen more to your customers or understand your customers better? Amazing. Thank you, guys. It was absolutely brilliant. And um, we have some questions for you. Um, Richard has asked, is store still the right reference point to use? Do we need a new language for these spaces? 
Well, I think that's a really good question, Richard. It touches on um, what I just said about visitors. To You feel like you're a visitor to Burberry and Shenzhen rather than a shopper. Um, you're going to have an experience. Um, it doesn't feel as if you're going in necessarily to purchase something. You might do, but you're going to experience something. You're going to try something. Um, so yes, possibly store isn't isn't the right word um, going forward. If, if, a, if a store is a place from which you buy something and take it away with you there and then. Yeah, I mean it's 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 there's a there's a blended spaces everywhere and and lots and, and no one single answer. I think it will. IKEA are doing lots of really interesting work at the moment globally. They are opening. Well, they've just opened it. I haven't been yet. They opened this. Tomorrow, in, that's why I haven't been. In tomorrow, in Hammersmith, in London, they open their first 50,000 square foot kind of city store in the UK. They've been opening them in other parts of the world. Their plan is to open 40 city stores over the next decade, but they're all going to be different. They haven't, they've, they've worked out they don't have one answer yeah. for urban customers. Yeah. They recognize there's a problem that, that they, people in, in, in densely populated cities tend not to drive, tend not want to pick up big, heavy things yeah, themselves. they've got the opposite problem to showfields, haven't they? Because the last yeah. thing you want is to be asked to carry something heavy and bulky and cumbersome out of, out of your IKEA and try and bundle it into a car, mm. and then it doesn't quite fit. So what customers want there is to be able to order it, to pay for it, and to know that it will be delivered on Friday. So it's about it's about a, it's a it's a kind of a hub where you where you deliver sales and also that that uh, this is a point we we talked about with flagships in our last session, mm -hmm. which was that how do you how are brands going to apportion or should brands apportion some of their sales yeah. to certain stores? So if you are to, to, to build Even on that show yeah, yeah the showrooming idea if you are also if you're IKEA and also showrooming that furniture but you don't you know you're not even allowing people to take it away is there a radius mm -hmm. 20 or 30 miles say yeah. around which if then a sale is uh, you know can, can some of the yes. value of that digital yeah. only yeah. online sale yeah. be attributed to yeah. your store because in fact they wouldn't have made the current yeah. wouldn't necessarily have made that purchasing decision without coming in and looking or trying at something yeah. so yes yeah, store is store will still be part of the language of retail but it I think space is going to continue to evolve and we'll need more words for them yeah. and more descriptions for them. Wow, thanks. Chris has asked, it's a good point. Apple leading the way in rebranding stores into experience centers and visitor centers and more seems to be changing. I don't think that's a question. I think it's just a statement. I think it's very interesting though. I was in... Um, uh, because well, it builds exactly on, on Richard's question and our answer, I yeah. think, which is that, that that's what's happening. But also, I was it's also hugely successful as a brand. I yeah. was in Brent Cross last Friday, shopping centre in North London, uh, meeting the developers to talk about a couple of potential projects there and took the opportunity to walk around. And this was a... This was a really bad day for weather in the UK. If anyone based in the UK will remember last Friday. Um, and so there weren't that many people there. But the Apple store or the Apple space was easily the busiest space at 11 o'clock in the morning last Friday. And it was doing all of the things that we're talking about, this blended experience. They were selling products. They were making money. But they were explaining things. They were talking to things. I, I mean, I don't know. I couldn't say for sure there was a there was a class going on, but there was there was that activity of people being in the space, having products or having 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 things explained to them and being talked through it. This this blur, you know, is it a classroom? Is it a shop? It's everything. It's if you get it right, and Apple have spent a huge amount of time honing what they do um, over the last twenty years, then. Then yes, you know there, there is nobody better there at, at the moment. I think globally in terms of the focus as well, there are a lot of interesting new brands coming up. Amazon are constantly experimenting with physical spaces, yeah. not to try and transform physical retail, but to understand their customers better, understand customer behaviour better, yeah. and understand which sectors of their enormous markets will benefit from different approaches. They are. They're learning. You well, know. They've just opened this one I mentioned to you this morning. This new Amazon style has just opened 30,000 square foot in LA. And it's, it's sort of showrooming looks and clothing. And what they do is instead of giving over all the space and lots of inventory, they're giving space to lots of styles. So lots of mannequins with lots of outfits. And they're encouraging you to look at the trends, to see what you'd like to choose. And then I haven't looked into it enough because I only read about it this morning. But 
through all sorts of clever apps and whatnot, you can ask a member of staff to bring you, you know, those trousers in, a, in whatever size you want and that top, and then you go to your personal changing room. So they're using the space to sell the looks and then so the inventory is, is obviously hidden away somewhere. Um, but yeah, exactly as Dan says, you get the sense that they're testing, they're learning, they're seeing what works um, mm -hmm. and they won't be afraid to iterate and to, and to put a new layer on or remove something that isn't working. And I think exactly. it's that sort of, courageous you know sort of you've got to be a bit brave you've got to mm -hmm. see if something works for your brand because something that yeah. works for one brand won't work for another but you've got to try so um Jorge or George I'm sorry you have said your name wrong um has asked what would be the best location for this type of store I think this is a, a more of an opinion situation than it is an actual answer but what would what would be the best location for this type of store if you can it recommend on, it, it yeah. depends on the brand doesn't it um yeah. something you touched on the other week dan you were talking about um uh it's a u.s brand um what are they they're a sort of outward bound brand so um, patagonia right. 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 exactly yes right. so th th they have they have they have um they have stores in locations that are relevant to the sports that they supply products for so if it's mountaineering there'll be a store in a mount in a, in a climbing district so if you know if you're going to go and buy this they, they recognize that the people who buy their products their fans their customers do a lot of climbing of this particular product so so they'll have the store there rather than necessarily you know a traditional location mm -hmm. like oxford street or sloan square to, or you know or somewhere in paris somewhere in rome um, I don't think it's about the traditional flagship locations. I think it's about, and that's where the um, you, the digital natives have that wonderful confidence because they have the data, because they know where the customers live. They understand that, you know, if it's a sporting brand, they'll know what sporting um, mm -hmm. equipment they're buying. They're able to make those those investment decisions with more confidence because they can, they can it's less of, it's taking less of a punt. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, it, it depends on your brand is the answer. It depends on your brand and your product and where people want to use it and want to engage with it. Um, it could still be, it could still be um, a huge department store or a huge kind of edifice to retail in a capital city that is an absolute destination and draws people in. That's not, that's not dead and not working anymore. It just needs rethinking like everything else. Well, or IKEA is, is the example. IKEA that's taking the Topshop site, obviously, so yeah. for example, I don't think anyone would have said they could see that coming. No, no, like but, but, but equally, it could be that actually what you want instead of that one place to draw everybody is that you want five or 15 mm -hmm around territory yeah. that are smaller that focus that experience to what what your data is telling you your customers want from the brand yeah. and also what you want to give them it's not just about meeting customers needs it's about thinking about what else can your brand do how mm -hmm. else can it express itself and how can it connect with customers and and blur that digital physical boundary it's because your customers are going to be interacting with your brand at home when they're sitting doing something in the evening while they're watching the tv or talking to their partner or their friends they're going to be interacting with your brand potentially on their way into work in the same format mm -hmm. they're going to be interacting with your brand while they're in your store and they're going to be maybe making a final purchase decision with your brand after they visited the store when they're going somewhere else so it's a real the real skill or challenge is about connecting all of those touch points into a, as seamless an experience as you can and getting your physical strategy right because you understand where your customers are or where they want to be and when they're in the right frame of mind to connect with you. Absolutely. Um, we are out of time. Thank you. Anything that wasn't answered, feel free to send that over to us by email. Um, inquiries at canada.co.uk uh, is also available to all of you. I want to thank you all for joining um, and we hope to see you guys at our next uh, webinar in March. I'll be sending out the links. It's on um, check out free stores. Are they the future? That's what we're going to be discussing. Uh, loads of excitement there. Thank you all. Have a lovely rest of your day, rest of your week, um, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Everyone. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.